Hello, and welcome to this episode of Pastor's Corner. I'm Thomas Hogan, Senior Pastor of Amazing Grace Church of the Nazarene in Walla Walla, Washington. If you haven't yet, please subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can get the latest updates on new content that we upload. Also, if you would, please like this video. And as well, if you have comments or questions, please feel free to uh, put those in the comment section below. We're continuing our discussion uh, in Pastor's Corner on There's a Man Going Around Taking Names. As we look at the book of Revelation, and we're, we're quickly coming to an end. Uh, today we find ourselves in Revelation chapter 18. In this episode, uh, is a, this, epi this episode, this video, is a follow-up to the sermon video, The Woman and the Scarlet Beast, from Revelation chapter 17. So we pick up right where we left off. So if you haven't watched that video yet, I would encourage you to go watch uh, the, the video, the sermon video, The Judgment of the Harlot, uh, which corresponds to this video. Let's begin by reading Revelation chapter 18, verses 1 and 3. And after these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried out with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. And she has become a dwelling place of demons, and a prison of every unclean spirit, and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. For all the nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. We need to consider and talk about Babylon and, and, I, and what that represents, who it represents. We should recognize by now that Babylon in the book of Revelation, isn't Babylon the ancient empire that we are familiar with? It's symbolic for Rome. Rome is in the midst of persecuting the church. And as Jesus told uh, the churches in his letters, it's about to get worse. We should, and so we need to recognize that. This was a community, this was in fact commonly used in the church. And the Jews used it. For Rome, it was very common, and, and you know it's outside of Revelation. Peter used it in First Peter five thirteen. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends greetings, as so, and so does my son Mark. In Revelation, John is trying to give us a view of Rome from God's perspective. This is what God sees. Babylon became for the Jews and early Christians the most graphic image or metaphor for a city filled with arrogance, sin, injustice, oppression of God's people, and, and idolatry. And brethren, think about that. A, a city or nation filled with arrogance, sin, injustice, oppression of God's people, and idolatry. Brethren, we live in Babylon. And so it should not surprise us that the first century that in the first century when Titus destroyed Jerusalem in AD 70 Jews understood the experience as Babylon all over again. That's where their minds went to as Jerusalem was conquered. Concerning this Scott McKnight uh, in Revelation for the rest of us says labeling Rome and Babylon was also resistance language. It named the problem Rome, and it gave that problem a label. Systemic sinfulness and injustice and idolatry and oppression to God. Or, excuse me, in opposition to God. This also makes Babylon a timeless metaphor. So many Christians and readers of Revelation look for a single specific future city or country. So much so that they lose what John is writing to the first century Christians. Letting us see Rome from God's perspective and then taking that and applying it to our own nation today. 
seeing Babylon as a metaphor applies it to any nation in history filled with immorality, idolatry, and the bloodshed of God's people. It can be any nation. It doesn't have to be one specific nation. And where that comes from is people see Revelation as all about end times. Now, there are parts of that, and uh, next week we'll be getting into that. As we go to 19, 20, 21, and 22, there are instances in those chapters that very much are end times getting to what is going to happen when judgment happens and what in discussion about the lake of fire and also heaven, the new heavens and the new earth. But right now, this, this isn't a series of events to unlock when Jesus comes back and, and unlock when judgment is. This is God bringing about his judgment and wrath on a nation that is very sinful, very idolatrous, and full of abominations. And this has happened throughout history. And, and again, as we look at the description of, of the symbolic Babylon in the book of Revelation, we see application in our own day and time as well. Because the United States is a nation that fits within the bounds of that metaphor. And as I, as I look at the history of Rome, as I look at what, how Rome is talked about here, how Rome is talked about in the New Testament, as I understand Rome, as I read about it, uh, its history, we as a nation are following the same steps as Rome. Our current division, letting go of objective truth, objective moral values, etc., is weakening the foundations of our country. And thus, we eventually will fit in very well with Revelation 18, 2, and 3. And he cried out with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. And she has become a dwelling place of demons and a prison of every unclean spirit and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. For all the nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her. And the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. Scott McKnight goes on to say, There is nothing in the description of Babylon in Revelation 17 and 18 to make one think he is referring to some future empire. Babylon for John was very present and very now. Babylon for John was Rome. You see, we meet, we meet the dragon and Babylon in spiritual, moral, cultural, political, economic, and educational degradation that bring death, block freedoms that are designed to bring allegiance to the dragon. Babylon is the biggest problem for the seven churches. And it is the biggest problem we face in our churches today. The simmering problem in Babylon, in Rome, was paganism and rampant immorality. Leaving Rome open to demons and unclean spirits of all sorts. Listen, if you would, as we go to the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy 32, beginning at verse 35. Vengeance is mine and retribution. In due time their foot will slip. For the day of their calamity is near, and the impending things are hastening upon them. For the Lord will vindicate his people and will have compassion on his servants when he sees that their strength is gone and there is none remaining bond or free. And he will say, Where are the gods, the rock in which they sought refuge? And so here, God is saying the same thing as he's un loading his wrath on Rome. Where are your gods? Where is the rock in which you take refuge? Why are they not protecting you? Because I alone am King of kings and Lord of lords. I alone am God Almighty. And we're seeing God's work. N.T. Wright said, It is God's own work turning wickedness back on itself, allowing arrogance to reach a giddy height from which it can only crash 
helpless to the earth. John is describing the fall of Rome with sadness and realism. God takes no pleasure or joy in the destruction of, it, of people. He takes no pleasure out of destroying Rome. And I believe that's why the message, as John is unpacking about Babylon falling and God's judgment against it, there isn't, there isn't happiness and joy here. It takes a very somber tone. There's sadness in the words of John. Bruce Metzger made this point, despite all her sins and crimes, there are many who mourn for her. They mourn over the fall of Babylon. God finds no joy in the punishment of a nation. And I remember what God said to Ezekiel in Ezekiel 18 and verse 30. And remember, Ezekiel is writing to people who are in a, a, an internment camp on the uh, Chaldean Peninsula. They're not even in Babylon. And yet they're, they're in this camp, and they, they long for the days of being in the temple. And Ezekiel's had to share with them that the temple has been destroyed. Jerusalem has fallen. And notice what he says as he tells the people, God did this because you turn your backs on him. You weren't worshiping the God of our fathers. And in the midst of this chapter, notice what, it, what Ezekiel, God says through Ezekiel, Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, each according to his conduct, declares the Lord. Repent and turn away from all your transgressions, so that iniquity may not come to become a stumbling block to you. Cast away from you all your transgressions which you have committed, and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die, O house of Israel? And listen, for I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord God. Therefore, repent and live. God has no joy in, in a nation that dies and the people of that nation that die. He takes no pleasure in it. He never has. And thus, we see an appeal for people of God to come out and I heard, in verse 4, And I heard another voice from he heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you may not practice in her sins, that you may not receive of her plagues. In chapter 18, and verse 4. God calling His people to come out. Separate yourselves. Don't, don't go that way. And brethren, we see so many today in the church going the way of society and wanting us to be acceptable, uh, to, to accept the ways of society, that, that transgender is okay, that homosexuality is okay, and we should be affirming of it and accepting of it, and God loves them, and God accept, th those are not sins. And brethren, yes, God loves them. But those are an abomination to... to to change the very creation in the way that God created you, to live a lifestyle that Scripture has said is completely immoral. God doesn't accept those things. Never has. And God is calling, has called, and will always call His people to come out from among them. Paul said that to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 18. Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Notice Paul says, Therefore come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you. And I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Have we found ourselves giving in to the pressures of our own society to accept and affirm what society says we should do, ignoring the pleas of God to come out from among them and be separate, to love on them and share the only good news that can change their life? 
And brethren, whether we're talking about trans, transgender, homosexuality, drunkenness, any sexual immorality, adultery, murder, the appeal of God is always to love on them. Why? So that they can see Christ in us and make life change in their life. By letting God in, God can come in and change and completely turn around their life. They need to come into contact with the living God. For only the living God can turn their lives around. Our only command is to share the good news of the gospel, the death, the burial, and resurrection of Christ. And so we need to heed this call as well. Chapter 18 announces the demise of Rome's military might. There was a time when the marching of a Roman legion shook the earth and terrified the hearts of enemies and nations. Gordon Fee says, John is no longer interested in Rome's military might. Rather, he is here denouncing her economic policies, through which the leading families in Rome in particular had become fabulously wealthy during the years in which John was writing. So let's take all this and outline the chapter. The chapter begins with the lament for fallen Babylon. We read those verses, verses 1 through 3. Followed by a plea and warning for God's people to flee. Verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you may not practice in her sins, and that you may not receive her plagues. For her sins have piled up as high as heaven, and God has re remembered her iniquities. Pay her back even as she has paid, and give back to her double according to her deeds, in the cup which she has mixed, mixed twice as much for her. To the degree that, the glorified, that she glorified herself and lived sensuously, to the same degree give her torment and mourning. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen, and I am a, not a widow, and will never see mourning. For this reason, in the day her plagues will come, pestilence and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire, for the Lord God who judges her is strong. And then there's a series of three laments, a lament expressed by who had most to gain in this unholy allegiance. Verse 9, and the kings of the earth who committed acts of immorality and lived sensuously with her will weep and lament over her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance because of the fear of her torment, saying, Babylon, the strong city. Well, excuse me, woe, woe, the great city, Babylon, the strong city. For in one hour your judgment has come. Lament of the merchants. And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys her, buys their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and every kind of cryon wood and every article of ivory and every article made from every very costly wood and bronze and iron and marble and cinnamon and spice and incense and perfume and frankincense and wine and olive oil and fine flour and wheat and cattle and sheep and cargoes of horses and chariots and slaves and human lives and the fruit of your uh, and the fruit you long for has gone from you and all things that were luxurious and splendid have passed away from you and men will no longer find them the merchants of the things of these things who become rich from her will stand at a distance because of fear of her torment weeping and mourning saying woe woe the great city she who is clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls for in one hour such great wealth has been laid waste a lament from the shipmasters as well who are delivering these precious cargoes of the merchants. And every shipmaster and every passenger and sailor and as many as make their living by the sea 
stood at a distance and were crying out as they saw the smoke of their burning, saying, her burning, saying, What city is like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads and were crying out, weeping and mourning, saying, Woe, woe, the great city in which all who had ships at sea became rich by her wealth, for in one hour she has been laid waste. All of these had given into the se sexual immorality with Rome. And now they stand at a distance and watch her burn. And even throw dust on themselves and weep and wail. Perhaps because they witnessed the end of their wealth. As they relied on Rome so much for the wealth they had. And the ability to trade cargoes. All of that is gone as Rome falls. And then we get a surprising call in verse 20. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, because God has poured judgment for, her, for you against her. Rejoice, this, this call says. God has given pronouncement of judgment against Rome. You remember under the altar there were the the. The, the saints, the martyrs who were crying out to God, How long, O Lord? And now in heaven there's rejoicing because the answer to the question has happened. God has just now destroyed Rome. God has given his pronouncement. Then at the end, the finality of judgments expressed by way of symbolic action. Revelation 18 and verse 21, And a strong angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus will Babylon the great city be thrown down with violence and will not be found any longer. And the sound of the harpists and the musicians and flute players and trumpets will not be heard in you any longer. And no craftsman of any craft will be found in you any longer. And the sound of a mill will not be heard in you any longer. And the light of a lamp will not shine in you any longer. And the voice of the bridegroom and the bride will not be heard in you any longer. For your merchants were great men of the earth, because all the nations were deceived by your sorcery. And in her blood, and in her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints, and of all who had been slain on the earth. And you know, you think about that. Rome, li Rome that Rome, lies in ruins. There's no longer cheering in the Colosseum. There's no longer any joy of children playing games and running through the streets of ancient Rome. That's all gone. There is a city, Rome, built up around and over that city. But that's not the ancient Rome. That's not the Roman Empire. That, all of that, lies in ruins. Brethren, are we listening? Our nation needs to wake up or we face the same judgments of God against Rome. If we don't change, it's coming. I think it applies because the metaphor of Babylon applies to the United States Republic. We are Babylon. Sure, we're not an empire. We're a republic. And don't let people deceive you. We are not a democracy. We are a republic, a constitutional republic. But even as a republic, we are going and repeating the very same actions Rome did, allowing all kinds of sexual immorality, allowing deceitfulness and sin to be rampant and, and be made okay. Let us have ears to hear what God is saying to the churches, to us. Well, we have four chapters to go. So that's two sermons and two more podcasts. What a journey this has been. And, I, and we're not done yet. There is still four more chapters to go, and we'll, we will be talking about it. Are we listening? I hope you have a great day.
I hope you take these things and study them further for yourself. Dig into God's word for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Don't take N.T. Wright's word for it. Don't take Scott McKnight's word for it or Brute Smesker or any commentary you may be using. Look at it for yourself and put it in the context of Scripture as a whole. And look at the history around Rome and see if you come to the same possibilities of what this might all be saying. I pray that this has been a blessing for you, to you, and, and thank you for joining me in the Pastor's Corner.